Okay, so here we go. Um, just, just so you know here, um, and this is this is not to discourage you. This is just to let you know what's coming. I think this is probably the hardest chapter of the year, with with maybe the exception of electrochemistry. Um, this is kind of it. So now the good news is we've done a lot of. Um, building up to this point. So if you understand what has come before, which quite a few of you did, judging by the, the test scores. Okay. Um, yeah, I did. They haven't been put in yet. I'll put them in uh, first hour. So anyway, if you got that, this is just one additional step. Okay. What we have done so far is we have done um, just an acid, just a weak acid in water by itself calculating the pH of that, or just a weak base by itself, calculating the pH of that. All we're doing now is putting the two of them together. What if we have a weak acid and a weak base in the solution? And then we're going to talk about what that does when you add a strong acid or a strong base to the solution. Okay? So that's kind of where we're going with this. And I mean, <laughs> this is going to look very complicated at first. Just take a deep breath. It's not as bad as it looks. Okay? Especially if you understood the common ion effect video that Hopefully you guys watched over the our nice long break. Uh, yeah, it's probably completely gone now, but we'll we'll review it here, okay? And we'll do some review on this in class today, or on the common ion effect. All right. So if we have a weak conjugate acid base pair, okay, and we have quite a bit of both of them, then what this does it, it's called a buffered solution or just a buffer, okay? And uh, you guys are a little bit familiar with these. We've On the couple of titration labs that we've done, or the labs that we've done where we've measured pH, I have buffer solutions um, sitting out that you use to calibrate the pH meters. Okay, And the reason for that, it, usually it's pH 4 and pH 7. Um, the reason they're buffer solutions is because I don't entirely trust you guys. Okay, no offense, but you know someone might not rinse off the pH meter before putting it into the pH 7 after it's been in the pH 4. Well, the thing about a buffer solution is it doesn't change pH very much if you add a little bit of acid or base to it. Okay, And so that's why we use buffer solution, because it, the pH doesn't change so drastically. Um, so that this is a very useful type of solution. Um, our blood is very good at doing this, actually. Our blood resists changes to pH, and that's a good thing because our blood needs to be in a very specific pH range um, in order to be able to function properly. Okay, A lot of the chemical reactions in our body are pH dependent. Another example is seawater. There are a lot of ions in seawater that uh, resist pH change. Okay, And so that pH of seawater typically stays pretty, st pretty steady at uh, 8.1 to 8.3. Okay. Um, so basically what a buffer does, it has a weak acid and a weak base in it. Okay, The weak acid is there in case some strong base gets added to it. That weak acid can neutralize a little bit of that strong base. Okay, And has a weak base in there to neutralize any strong acid that gets added. All right. Now, the weak acid and the weak base need to not react with each other because that would obviously make it useless at that point. If you had a buffer solution where the weak acid and the weak base react, now they can't react with any strong acid or strong base that get added. Okay, um, so we're going to use conjugate acid-base pairs. And I, I'm going to show you examples of all this in a minute if the words are not entirely making sense right now. Um, a lot of times buffers are prepared, and this is I would say most of the time buffers are prepared by adding a weak acid or base and then a salt. So an example of that, and I think we're going to see this example uh, several times today, um, is acetic acid, HC2H3O2, and uh, maybe like sodium acetate. Okay, so what happens here, this is a, this is a weak acid, right? Acetic acid. If you put the NaC2H3O2 into water, what's it going to do? Okay, well, once it dissociates, right? Okay, so it's going to dissociate into Na plus the C2H3O2 two two minus, and what the acetate ion will do is pull an H off of water sometimes, okay? So what you end up with here 
is acetic acid and um, acetate. Okay. This is a conjugate acid base pair, right? If the H comes off of the acetic acid, it makes acetate. And if the acetate ion pulls an H off of the water, then it changes into acetic acid. Okay. So that's um, that would be a good example of a buffer solution or a buffer um, would be um, one that had those two particular species in it. Okay. Um, the the acetic acid. If you put a, a, a strong base into that solution, as long as it wasn't too much of a strong base, the acetic acid could neutralize it, help to neutralize it. Okay. If you put um, a strong acid, why is this thing? Sorry, my thing is tangled. Um, if you put a strong acid into the water, then that weak base could help to neutralize it, as long as there's not too much of the the strong acid that's added. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the idea there. So how could we make a buff? Whoops. <laughs> I should read ahead on my notes. How could we make a buffer solution out of a solution containing acetic acid? OK. So I basically just answered that question. Um, again, acetic acid is HC2H3O2. This is what you can write in your blank. Um, so if you've already got that in there, then you can just add um, Maybe in a C2H3O2. It doesn't have to be sodium acetate, but that's that's a very common ion there. Okay. So if you add this to it, then you've got that acid conjugate base pair, and that's a pretty good buffer solution. Okay. How could we make a buffer solution out of a solution containing ammonia? Okay. So what's ammonia first of all? Close. That's ammonium, okay? But we're going to need that in a second. Ammonia is NH3, okay? So let's just think about this for a second. When ammonia um, reacts with water, what does it do? Is that an acid or a base or nothing? Uh, this one's this one might be amphoteric, but it's typically going to do one, one thing. Okay, remember this nitrogen has an, a lone pair over here, okay? Which, again, nitrogen is kind of one of the key things you're looking for with a weak base, okay? So because it has nitrogen in it, because this nitrogen has a lone pair when you draw its Lewis structure, that's going to be a weak base. In other words, it can pull the hydrogen off of water. That's what it's typically going to do. Okay? So if it does that, and sometimes it's helpful just to write the reaction that happens here, it's going to make NH4 plus plus OH minus, right? Okay, so this is our base. What's the conjugate acid? NH4 plus. These two things are connected, right? So a good buffer solution that contains ammonia is also going to have a, a significant amount of NH4 plus. Well, how could we put NH4 plus in a solution? We can't just add ammonium ions, usually. Give me an example of a salt that might have ammonium ion in it. Ammonium has a 1 plus charge. Let's pair it with something that has a 1 minus charge. That's a fairly simple. OK, ammonium hydroxide would not be a good choice because that would be a strong base, right? OK. So let's, let's do something that's going to make a, uh, a weak acid here. And, and we need to pick an anion that's not going to do anything in the solution. OK. For example, yeah, OK, chlorine, right? OK, chlorine does nothing in the solution. So when we add that, we don't have to worry about the anion. So what I would do in this one to make a good buffer solution is do something like ammonium chloride, OK? Because when that um, dissociates in solution, it's going to make NH4 plus, And then it's going to make an anion that we don't care about because it doesn't react with the water, OK? Um, all right, so that's that. Um, the general equation for a buffer, if you have a weak acid in one of its salts, um, 
where m plus is a cation that does not react with water, and x minus is the conjugate base of hx. Okay. Um, so a general equation here for that, if we've got hx um, I want to write this. It honestly, it doesn't matter either way. I'm trying to think of the way that's the least confusing. You can write this with H3O plus, or you can write it with just the H plus. I think I'm going to go with the H plus on this one. So remember, our, our general weak acid equation is like this, H plus plus X minus, right? Um... Now, the MX, where, where's the MX in here? It's really nowhere. Here's the thing. We don't include the M in the net ionic equation because we just said M plus is a cation that doesn't react with water. So we don't care about it, right? So basically what we're doing in this, in this solution here, we've got this weak acid that's dissociating and making the, the conjugate base. And then we have some M plus in here because we put in MX. Right? But the M plus doesn't matter because it's not doing anything, so we just take it out of the equation. All right? So then if we write the Ka expression for this equation, how would I write that? Now here's what I know you guys can do. Okay, on the top we've got H plus times X minus over HX. All right, so now if we solve this equation for H+, plus, which you're going to wonder why we're doing that at first, but um, basically we need to multiply the HX times the Ka, right? Um, so then we've got uh, Ka times HX over X minus is equal to H+. Plus. Okay? Does that make sense? So there's a reason why I did that. And the reason why is because in a good buffer solution, and we actually did this on the last lab that we did. You just didn't realize we were doing it. In a good buffer solution, you have equal concentrations of the HX and the X minus. Well, what happens in this equation if you have equal concentrations of the HX and the X minus? Then you, these cancel out, and the K equals the H plus concentration, right? And then if you rewrite that equation, which we'll do in a minute, then the pH equals the pKa, if you take the negative log of both sides. Okay? So that ends up being very useful. The best buffer solution is going to be one that has equal concentrations of your acid and its conjugate base in the solution. Okay? All right, so the H plus depends on two things. It depends on what is the Ka for the weak acid, and it depends on the Hx to X, X minus ratio. Okay? Now, Here's where it gets a little bit tricky, okay? And this is where you, you start, sort of have to start thinking about these things in, as sort of two-step problems, okay? Um, the first step is just going to be the reaction of the strong base of the strong acid with the solution. And then the next step is um, now what's happening in the equilibrium, okay? So, and, and this is on your notes a little bit further along. I'm going to say it several times. You need, to, you need to think about stoichiometry first on these types of questions. And then equilibrium, you need to think about second. Okay, you need to keep it in that order when we're doing these types of problems. Okay, so if I add strong base OH minus to this solution, a solution that has HX and X minus in it, what is the strong base going to react with? Okay, the strong base is not going to react with the weak base, right? That doesn't make any sense. Strong base is going to react with the weak acid, or the HX, okay? So the reaction here, HX plus OH minus. If I put some OH minus in the solution. Now, the reason we're just doing stoichiometry on this is because this reaction goes to completion. Remember, if you have a strong acid or a strong base in the solution, there is no equilibrium, okay? This strong base is going to completely react with any acid that's in that solution until it's all used up. Okay, that's what a strong base does. Okay, so this OH minus is going to react with the HX. How? What's it going to do? 
uh, you were about to say it, it's going to pull the hydrogen off the acid, right? Okay. To make water. Okay. So then you end up with H2O plus what else? X minus, right? Okay. So that is our reaction. If we put a strong base in the solution, then what happens is it reacts with the weak acid and it makes more of the X minus. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we've actually, you know, now we have more of this in the buffer. Okay. The more OH minus you add, um, the less of a buffer this becomes. And eventually you're going to use up all the HX and then it's not a buffer at all. Okay. All right. If we add a strong acid to this solution, if we add H plus, what is the H plus going to react with? Strong acid's not going to react with the weak acid, right? It's going to react with the weak base, so which is X minus. So HX plus, or H plus, sorry, plus X minus. And what is that going to do? And that one's probably even more obvious the way that I've written it. They combine, and they make HX, a weak acid. Okay. And so what happens there is now we have more of the HX in the solution, less of the X minus, okay? And so now our ratio is shifted so that we have more of the HX and less of the X minus, okay? But until these things are used up, until the HX and the X minus are used up, this solution will resist a change in pH, okay? Because basically what's happening is this weak base here is using up all these H plus ions so that the solution's pH doesn't change. It takes the H plus ions out of the solution and makes them into HX. Okay. The weak acid takes the OH minus ions out of solution okay, and makes them into X minus so that, again, we don't end up with a basic solution uh, or a much more basic solution. Now, the pH is going to change a little bit, but it doesn't change by much. Okay, so that's how that works. Okay, as long as the strong acid or strong base that is added is small relative to the amount of the weak acid or the weak base, then the buffer solution will work. Now, if you just dump a whole bunch, you know, you don't dump 12 molar hydrochloric acid into a solution, a buffer solution. Obviously, what's going to happen is that H plus is going to react with all of the X minus that's in that solution until the X minus is gone, and then you'll have that drastic change in pH, okay? Um, but this is actually, and we'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, but this is why a titra titration works the way that it does. You guys remember how the titration thing sort of happens where it's, you know, it's when you first add the acid or the base, whatever you're titrating with, it's a very gradual climb in pH, and then all of a sudden, it spikes, right? Okay? What you're seeing there is buffer solution, buffer solution, buffer solution, and now the other ion that could take that out of solution is gone, okay? And so now this rapid increase in the pH is because you're just dumping a bunch of OH- minus into a solution that doesn't have any H plus in it anymore. Okay, so now you've got this huge increase in pH. So that's kind of the way that a titration works, all right? Buffers are going to be best at resisting the pH change uh, when the concentrations of weak acid and weak base are equal. We already talked about that, okay? And when they're equal, then the H plus concentration is equal to Ka, which we already talked about that as well. So it's, it's just there on your notes, which means the pH equals pKa. Now, all I'm doing with that P is I'm basically taking the negative log of both sides of this equation, okay? If I take the negative log of the H plus concentration and the negative log of the Ka, negative log of H plus we know is pH, okay? So negative log of the Ka is pKa. That P in front of it just basically means that we're taking the negative log of this, okay? All right. So buffer capacity, um, there's a difference between the buffer capacity and the pH of the solution, okay? Um, the buffer capacity is just talking about how much acid or base can you put into the solution before the pH starts to ch change drastically, okay? Um, and that depends on the amount, okay? 
That's the key word there when we're talking about buffer capacity. How much weak acid and weak base do we have in our buffer? That's going to determine how much strong acid or strong base we can add, and it still works. Okay. Now, the pH of the buffer doesn't depend so much on the amount. It just depends on the ratio between the two. Okay. Um, so, yeah, again, I guess if you're going to underline a word there, the pH is dependent on the ratio. The buffer capacity is dependent on the amount. Okay, let me show you an example of that. Um, so you've got a solution that is one molar acetic acid and one molar NaC2H3O2, okay, versus a solution that is 0.1 molar acetic acid and 0.1 molar um, NaC2H3O2. Okay, well, let's think about this for a second. Um, if I was going to find the pH of these two solutions, what do you think would be true about them? Okay, so remember, when the concentrations of the weak acid and its conjugate base are the same, then pH equals pKa, right? Um, or another way of saying that is, you know, H plus concentration is equal to the Ka. Now, we're talking about acetic acid in both instances, right? So the Ka is going to be the same, which okay, I have that here. I see. No, that's lactic acid. I thought that I had the Ka for acetic acid in here somewhere, but I might not. There it is. 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. Okay. 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. Okay. So there is the HF is probably what you're thinking of. That's times 10 to the negative fourth because that's a very common one that we've used also. All right. So what that means is if we've got, you know, if we take the negative log of this number, then the pKa is going to be equal to, I believe it's 4.74. Let me make sure. Yeah, 4.74. Okay. It doesn't matter whether we're using this solution or this solution, okay? The pH of both of those is going to be the same. Does that make sense? Because the ratio between the acid and the base are the same. They're both equal, okay? But which one of these two solutions can I add more acid or base to? The first one, right? And that's talking about the buffer capacity, okay? So when I ask you buffer capacity, what I'm asking you is which one of these solutions could we add more strong acid or strong base to before the pH really starts to drastically change, okay? And the answer there would be this top one because there's more of the weak acid and weak base in that solution, okay? So does that make sense? pH of both of those buffer solutions is 4.74, but the top solution is the one that can better resist pH change because you can put more H plus into it or more OH minus into it before it starts to change in pH. Okay? So that's the difference between buffer capacity and pH. Now, there's a very useful equation that you, I strongly recommend you use in this chapter rather than ice tables because it's going to save you some time. Okay? Now, this, this is not useful um, with the kind of scenarios we've learned so far. Okay, but when you have a significant quantity of the acid and the conjugate base, then this is a very useful solution. Okay, so um, remembering what we did earlier, our H plus concentration is equal to, I already forgot, it's, uh, it's Ka times, um, is it the base, the H, or the X minus over the HX, is that right? Or did I get it backwards? It's the HX over the X minus. Okay. Okay. So if we rearrange this thing, if we take the negative log of both sides, if I take the negative log of the H plus, what does that give me? pH, right? Negative log of H plus is pH. Okay. What's the negative log of the Ka? pKa. Now, here's where this gets a little bit tricky. Um, if I take the negative log of the HX over the X minus, I 
think that I'm doing my math right here. Um, when you take the negative log of both sides and you're multiplying these things together, then you end up subtracting them, okay? Because it's the negative log, okay? Now, if I want to change this to a positive log, then what I have to do is flip the stuff that's right here. Okay, so usually the way this equation is written is pH equals pKa plus the log of the X minus concentration over the HX concentration. Okay, and there's your, that's the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. You can call it the Henderson-Hasselhoff equation if you want to. It's a little bit easier, for, yeah, it's a little bit easier for me to remember that way. Um, for Hasselbalch Hasselbalk, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly or not. I always call him Hasselhoff. Um, okay, so there's your equation. Now, if the base concentration is equal to the acid concentration, then when we, you know, when we figure out the x minus over hx part, that ends up being 1. Well, what's the log of 1? You can try it on your calculator. Log of 1 is not 1. No. It's zero, okay? The log of one is zero, so basically, when the base and acid concentration are equal, this whole part of it, the log of the x minus over hx, it goes away, okay? And then, what we said before is true, pH equals pKa, right? We already said that, right? When the base concentration and the acid concentration are equal, then the pH equals the pKa because that back expression just becomes zero, okay? All right, so here's the sample problem. The pH of a buffer that is 0.12 molar in lactic acid and 0.10 molar in sodium lactate. And I'm giving you the Ka for lactic acid because I finally got my act together and started putting the Ks on the problems rather than just looking them up in the book. Um, well, there's two ways to solve this one, and I think I actually have that on your sheet, don't I? Well, I have an alternative solution. Did I give you some space to solve it the first way before the alternative solution? Okay. All right. So let me show you the old way that we've done it, okay? And then I'll show you using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, and uh, you're going to see that one is probably easier than the other. But I want to I connect this to what we've been doing, okay? So I've got lactic acid here, and my, my equation for lactic acid... what it's going to do in solution, it's going to look like this, okay? I'm going to go pretty fast through these because I want to make sure and get through at least most of this today. We have a little bit of leeway on tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's notes. Um, okay, so what is my initial concentration here of lactic acid? 0.12 molar, right? And you don't really have to put the molar there. Actually, let's not, because technically when we plug these into equilibrium expressions, they become activities, not concentration. Um, so 0.12, and then what is our initial concentration of the, um, the lactate ion? 0.1, okay. So this is a little bit different than our normal setup, but again, we did this in the common ion section that you hopefully watch the video on over the long weekend, okay? Now, how much H plus do we initially have in this solution? We're going to assume zero, okay? Now, again, we have just a tiny bit coming from the dissociation of water, but we're going to assume zero because it's so small compared to these high concentrations here, okay? So 0.12, zero, and 0 0.10. So it doesn't change a lot about our ice table. It just changes... Uh, you know, this is not just going to be x over here, all right? So now this is still going to go down by x because, you know, obviously if there's no H+, plus, then you can't form any of the acid, right? So this equilibrium has to go to the right. Um, this is going to be plus x and plus x here. So we end up with 0.12 minus x, x, and 0.10 plus x, all right? <coughs> Now, my Ka is decently small here, and my molarities that I'm working with are decently large. So I'm going to assume, like we usually do, that my x is fairly insignificant relative to this 0.12 and the 0.10 over here. All right? 
So when I rewrite this expression, it's going to be 1.4 times 10 to the negative fourth is equal to. Now on the top, here's where you have to be careful. Okay, this is the x, but then the other one, we're going to drop the x. We're going to assume it. 0.1 plus x is basically just 0.1 because we're going to assume that the x is fairly small. Okay, and then you divide that by the 0.12 minus x. We're going to assume that's just 0.12. Okay, so still fairly simple to solve. You're just rearranging, solving for x here. It's actually maybe even a little bit easier because you don't have to take a square root. If you really don't like square roots, then it's easier, I guess. And then divide it by the point one. One point six eight times ten to the negative fourth. Okay, that is our um, concentration of H plus. What did I say? One point six eight times ten to the negative fourth. Technically, one point seven times ten to the negative fourth, I guess. And then if we take the negative log of that, that's going to give us the pH. Okay, negative log of that concentration gives me a pH of three point seven seven. Okay, and that makes sense, right? That's fairly fairly straightforward. Now let me show you something else for your alternative solution here. I'm going to keep that pH equals 3.77 up here, but I'm going to erase the rest of this. <coughs> Let's plug this into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Now, let me be very clear. This is for buffer solutions only, okay? Don't use this for other things, but when you have a buffer solution, which means you have the acid and its conjugate base present in significant amounts, you can use this, okay? pH equals pKa, all right? Now, the pKa, we have to take the negative log of our Ka right here, all right? So negative log of 0.4 times 10 to the negative fourth. It's going to give me about 3.85. plus the log of our base concentration over our acid concentration. All right, once again, what's our base concentration? This equation does require you to identify which one is the acid, which one's the base, but hopefully that's fairly simple. I'm guessing lactic acid is probably the acid, right? And the base is going to be the other one, <laughs> okay? So, point one. O is our base, right, divided by 0.12, which is our acid, okay? You plug all that in, and again, I don't trust my calculator that much, so what I usually do is I take the 0.1 divided by the 0.2 first, and then I go ahead and take the log of, of that, okay? That's giving me a negative number. That's okay, okay? If, this, if the numerator is smaller than the denominator, you're going to get a negative number for your log expression. And then you just add that to the 3.85 and look what I get. 3.77. Okay. So that's a nice little shortcut that you can use when you have a buffer solution. I think this equation is much faster than using an ice table. Okay. Yeah. So again, you can only use it when we're talking about buffer solutions. So you get on the AP exam, don't start using this for everything. Okay. But if you have a buffer solution, this is well. What's going to happen is, what's going to happen if you try to use this? If you have none of the base to start with, well, now you've got zero over 0 0.12. If you have none of the acid to start with, then you have an undefined term here, right? And so you're going to you're going to realize pretty quickly. Wait, this doesn't work. Okay, so you can only use this when you have significant concentrations of both. Okay. All right. Uh, next problem, how many moles of NH4Cl must be added to 2 liters of 0.1 molar NH3 to form a buffer whose pH is 9? <laughs> yeah, this one's tough. We, we maybe could do, well, okay. Let's see here. Let's see if we have a buffer solution to start with. Well, okay, here's, here's the problem with this one. We don't really have a buffer to start with. We're trying to make one, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I like that equation, too. Yeah, unfortunately, on this one, this is an example of one. And I don't, 
anticipate them giving you one like this on the AP exam, but this is good to talk about because it, it helps you to sort of thoroughly understand what's going on here. We're probably going to have to use an ice table for this one because we don't, what we're assuming here is that we don't have any of the NH4Cl in there to begin with. We need to add some in to make a buffer solution, okay? So we've got to figure that out. Um, so the relevant equation here This, this may be a little different than you might think, okay, because, well, let's see, how do I want to start this one? You can really do this one both ways, one, one of two ways. You could start with the NH3, because, I mean, that's, that's probably more technically correct for this particular problem, because we're starting with the NH3, right? And then we want to know how much of the NH4 plus we need to add into it. Um, But, you know what I think I'm going to do here? I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it the other way, because our, um, I think it'll be a little bit simpler if we think about it the other way. Maybe it doesn't matter that much on this one, but it's, it's maybe good to get in the habit of writing it in terms of the acid equilibrium just because the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation applies to the acid equilibrium rather than the base, okay? So if we've got NH4+, plus, okay, that's dissociating an H plus and NH3, um, basically what we're trying to figure out here is how much NH4 plus do we need to start with here, okay, in order to get a solution whose pH is, is 9. Okay, so so here's here's the tricky part on this one. Okay, the tricky part is our x is going to be in a different spot than normal. Okay, our x is up here because we don't know how much NH4 plus we need to add into this solution. Okay, so that's that's where this one's a little bit tricky. Now we can assume that we don't have any of this to begin with, but we know. Uh, the concentration of our NH3, right? It's 0.1 initially. And we're also going to assume that we're adding solid ammonium chloride, so it's not going to change the volume of our solution here. Um, that's kind of an important assumption. Okay. All right. So uh, basically when we work out our ice table here, they give us one other piece of information that helps us out. What else do they tell us? Say it again. Okay, they give us the KB. That's going to help us. Actually, I guess they give us two pieces of information. But they give us another one that helps us with the equilibrium concentrations. They give us the pH, right? Okay. The pH is 9. So if we, if we 10 that, the concentration of the H plus at equilibrium is going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 9th. Everyone follow that? Because our pH is 9. Okay. So what that means is, that means that the H plus concentration changed by 1 times 10 to the negative 9th. That means the NH3 concentration also must have changed by 1 times 10 to the negative 9th because we can look at stoichiometry in this change column. And this must have gone down by 1 times 10 to the negative 9th. Okay. So then... <laughs> What we end up with here, um, now you can punch this into your calculator. If you take 0.1 and you add 1 times 10 to the negative 9th to that, what do you think your calculator is going to tell you? It's going to tell you 0.1 still, right? Okay, because to our number of sig figs, that's, that 1 times 10 to the negative 9th has no effect on anything whatsoever. So we can probably assume here that x minus 1 times 10 to the negative 9th is just x. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we might go back and check that assumption at the end. Probably not for the sake of time. I'll tell you, I checked it yesterday, and it, we're fine to make that assumption. Okay. Um, so now we've got our setup. We've got our equilibrium concentrations. Okay. We've got our Kb. Now... 
that's halfway helpful. What do we really need here? Because of the way I wrote the equation. Well, no, you don't tend this one. You don't negative log it. You use the... Remember this equation? Okay? Ka times Kb equals Kw. So, what we're doing here, I wrote the equation with respect to the conjugate acid. Now, why did I do that? I mean, it, wouldn't it be much easier to just use the Kb? Because, again, I want you to get used to the idea that for the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, you need the Ka, not the Kb. Okay? Now, on this one, we can't use Henderson-Hasselbalch, unfortunately, but I just want you to get in the habit. So, um, if we take 1 times 10 to the negative 14th and we divide that by the 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5th, that gives me 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10th, okay? So 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10th is equal to um, 0.1 times 1 times 10 to the negative 9th divided by x. Okay, so now we're just solving for x. So then, um, let's see here, so I think the point 0.1 times 1 times 10 to the negative 9th, which I should have been able to see that in my head, 1 times 10 to the negative 10th. And then you end up dividing that by the 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10th. Does everybody understand that when you're looking at your algebra? So my x here ends up being uh, point 0.1 getting 0.18 to our two sig figs, okay? Now, that's our concentration, okay? But that's not what they're asking us for. They're asking us how many moles of NH4Cl must be added to two liters of water, okay? So one more step here. Molarity equals moles over liters, okay? We know our molarity is 0.18. We know our volume is 2 liters, so, you know, times that by 2, and that's going to give you the number of moles. So your number of moles ends up being 0.36, and I don't have any room to write that now. Um, but that's how much of the NH4Cl we would have to add into this solution in order to make it a pH 9 solution. Now, if you wanted to check yourself here, then you could plug this, now you'd have to change this, you'd have to use the concentration, the 0.18. But you could plug that into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and see if you end up with a pH of 9. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Let's see if we have time for any more here. Um, we talked about this earlier, that reactions between strong acids and weak bases go to completion. And as long as we don't put in too much of the strong acid or the strong base, then um, we can assume that that OH minus or that H plus is going to be completely consumed by the buffer. Okay. Um, now, I kind of already did this, didn't I? I feel like I already did this. So this is kind of a repeat. Um, Okay, here's the last thing that I want to say today, and then we'll actually go over these examples tomorrow before we start the titration stuff, because we've got two days for titration notes, so I think we'll have time to go over this during the titration stuff. But you need to remember this. Stoichiometry comes first, okay? Equilibrium second when you're doing these types of calculations, and this will make more sense, I think, once we talk about this tomorrow, okay? Okay, and then we've just got the two practice problems left, and then we're done. All right, yeah, so that'll be fun tomorrow. We'll start with these incredibly hard practice problems. All right, see you guys in class.